Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Hildreth. We will get started in just a moment. We're going to give people a minute or two to log in and get comfortable. So hold tight and we'll be right with you. Okay, and away we go. Thank you for joining us today for our second session of our three-part back to school webinar series. Welcome back to those of you who joined us last week and thank you to everyone who's joining us today. Like I just mentioned, my name is Erin Hildreth. I'm part of the responsibility.org team. And before we get started, uh, and just like last time, I wanna let you know, you probably heard it, but um, we will be recording this session today. It'll be available on the responsibility.org YouTube channel uh, later today or early tomorrow. And then we will also send out the links to all three of our webinar sessions after the conclusion of the third session, which is next week, September 15th. Everyone is on mute at this time. And if you have a question during the session, please enter it into the Q&A box, which is right next to the chat box, because that will help us address your question a little bit more easily. For those of you not already familiar with responsibility.org, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you about our mission and values. Our mission consists of three main parts. We work to eliminate underage drinking. We work to eliminate drunk driving and work with others to eliminate all forms of impaired driving. And we work to empower adults of legal drinking age who choose to drink to do so responsibly. Over the past 30 years, we've made great progress on all three of these missions. We have not done it alone because we all have a seat at the table of responsibility and responsibility starts with each one of us. Responsibility.org values conversations that lead to a lifetime of healthy alcohol choices. And we know that not every conversation is about alcohol. We have a social responsibility as well to be good citizens and good humans and to raise our kids to be the same. Uh, last week when we met, there were still a few people with kids who had not yet started school. Now that Labor Day has come and gone, I think we've all jumped into the classroom, the dorm room, or whatever your kid's situation may be this school year. Any way you slice it, we are back to school. And back to school is not just a day. It's a season. It's not a moment. It's a series of events. New friends, new rules, new guidelines and that all leads to new conversations. So I'm really excited to bring this back to school webinar series to you, starting with last week's session about connecting with schools and the refreshing focus on the social and emotional learning of all kids of all ages. And we're continuing today with something that's been on all of our minds over the last year and a half, mental health. I would like to introduce our panelists and moderator who have been generous with their time today and especially generous with their expertise. And these panelists include Dr. Mary Alvord, psychologist, founder, the founder of Resilience Without Borders and co-author of Conquer Negative Thinking for Teens. Dr. Katie Friedman, a pediatric ER physician, an influencer at foreverfreckled.com and a responsibility.org national advisory board member. And Keir Gaines, a therapist, a mental health advocate, internet personality and member of the responsibility.org parenting influencer team. So I'm going to now pass the floor over to Juliana Miner. Some of you may know Julie from her social media presence and rants from mommy land. She's not only an amazing person, but she's also honest and refreshing, bright and funny. In addition to that, she is a longtime friend of responsibility.org and a parent herself. She's the author of Raising a Screen Smart Kid, Embrace the Good and Avoid the Bad in the Digital Age. We're honored to have her here, we're honored to have our panelists, and we're honored to have all of you. Julie? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for participating, and thank you to responsibility.org for hosting us all. Um, let's get started talking about how our kids' mental health is doing. The past year, uh, the past year and a half has been really difficult on everyone. And there's a lot of data indicating that um, kids as young as five are experiencing some mental health setbacks and challenges. 
What are you seeing uh, both in parents and in kids? Can we start with you, Kier? See, one thing we see in parents is an inability to think. I forgot to take my mute off. Uh, yes, thank you so much. So in parents, one thing that I'm noticing is a phenomenon that we call joyless parenting. And what happens in joyless parenting is when you are at a state of exhaustion to the point where you don't enjoy the normal things that you enjoy about parenting, self-explanatory, right? But uh, the downside is less patience for and with your children, a higher likelihood of having burnout at work and an inability to set borders and boundaries between work and home. And it is really stressing a lot of parents out. Conversely, children... We have a tendency to scale down sometimes their issues um, or minimize them because they have less responsibilities than adults, but they just have a different scale of the same size issue to them. Uh, it's like it's like tax. Tax is 10% on a dollar. 10% doesn't seem that bad when it's a dollar, but if all you have is $2, then that 10% that is a lot of money. Um, so with that being said, with children, I'm seeing a lot of avoidance behaviors starting to peak, particularly around education, particularly around social interactions that are of the Zoom, Microsoft, uh, teams, WebEx, nature. What were you saying about not being able to think and unmute yourself in a good, in a timely way? <laughs> I totally am seeing that too. Um, those are really great points. Mary, do you see those same things happening in, Dr. Mary, I should say, in older kids as well? I do, you know, and I would say parents have felt, I'll, I'll start with the parents a moment just to piggyback to what was said, because I've also found parents are not only exhausted because they were trying to virtually work and handle all that was going on at home. And often we're taught as parents to put our kids first. And I always use that perhaps overused you know, a little visual of put your oxygen mask on first to really then be able to help. And with older kids, of course, they're working on independence. So I wanna say teens and college age students, they're rearing to go. And here, what happened was they were really put in a stall mode. For the high school students, it was inability to engage in all those outside activities. and. What's more important to a teen is their peer group than just hanging out or doing sports or doing anything. And the mental health toll was the, the isolated feelings of isolation and of course anxieties of not feeling accepted because you didn't have that peer group and the constant feedback. For the college students, you know, all of a sudden they were looking forward to their freedom and their independence and their acceptance, perhaps if they were, you know, doing and experimenting with certain things and suddenly they were back in their rooms. And uh, so again, not knowing how to navigate virtual school, it took a tremendous toll. And just to add one more thing, I think for college students, even now that they're getting back and for teens, it's how long are we going to stay back? You know, are they going to have to shut down dorms? And how is that going to work? And for teens and children too, I think we're still, uh, the toll of uncertainty is continuing. So we have to keep that very much in mind. It's not just what happened, but what it's continuing to happen. I think you make a really good point because all of that uncertainty um, is really anxiety producing for a lot of people, both adults and, and kids. Dr. Katie, what are, are you seeing similar things? Um, and what are your thoughts about specifically how parents are handling everything? You know, it's it's interesting. I'm in the I'm in a pediatric emergency room. So when people come to the pediatric emergency room, it's usually it's usually under a heightened stressful situation. But what I'm seeing with a lot of my adolescents or my teenage um, children that are were suffering from you know alcohol abuse, depression, suicidal ideation, which is on the rise. And in the beginning of this pandemic, I said this is a pandemic that we're not even talking about. You know, this is mental health is really in its own 
it's surging in its own pandemic. And I think a lot of that, I'm gonna piggy off both of my panelists by saying that, you know, there's, it's twofold, right? So parents are overtired, they're frustrated, they have their own stresses and they're trying to manage working from home and also helping, you know, their children. And so, as you said, the back to the, like, instead of going to school, they're back in their room. Well, a lot can happen when kids go back into their room. A lot can happen when kids are kind of left to their own demise and that we've been struggling and fighting, you know, to try to control the social media. And now we're in a pandemic when we really can't leave the house and all of a sudden that has come to the forefront. And I've seen a, a drastic um, correlation between the amount of social media use and the amount of screen time and, you know, children that are depressed because they don't get that break from social media like they do in the school year. So in, in, in the school day when they're at school. So we see a lot of parents that are frustrated and I would say almost surprised to see that their children are suffering as much as they are. And I would say that that also is a result, a direct result of a almost like a lack of communication because of the fatigue that's occurring, because everyone is in such a heightened stressful situation that they're dealing with their own stuff and not necessarily, you don't see as much communication as maybe we did see before where it was dinner time and we were talking about our highs and lows of the day because everyone's just scrambling to kind of get done what they need to get done within the four walls of their house. Um, and so a lot of parents, I think, are kind of taken back to see that their kids are struggling. And what I would say and always recommend to my parents is, you know, make sure to find time to check in with your children, make sure to find time to check in not only with their physical health, but their mental health, because a lot of kids are struggling right now. And we almost don't know the signs or we don't see it until they're at the point where they're coming to see me because they are having that, you know, those, those feelings of suicidal ideation or they're, or you're abusing drugs or alcohol. Thank you for bringing that up. And I actually want to dig in a little bit to something that you just said that we might not recognize the signs. So can we talk a little bit about what some of those red flags are or signs that our kids are struggling? I know that there are some parents who have a really difficult time teasing out what is a bad week and a and a bad problem. What is a new developmental phase or a, a change in their well-being that, that needs further attention? Um, so can you talk specifically about some signs that parents should be looking for? Mary. Sure. Oh, Mary. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, you know, my key is a behavior in and of itself doesn't signify that it's a, you know, a struggle. So there may be waves of some sadness that we can talk through and figure out what is going on that may actually be very real and relevant and appropriate because they're missing their friends or there's, you know, let's not forget there's loss of life that has happened that has impacted many, many hundreds of thousands of people and the ripple effect. But what I say to parents, signs your children are traveling, struggling, or look at sudden changes in behavior. And, you know, Kira mentioned avoidance, avoidance, withdrawal, isolation. That's been a little bit difficult to parse out during the pandemic when naturally we had to do more isolation and there were so many restrictions. But look at, you know, is your child reaching out to friends? How are they reaching out to friends? Um, are they going outside and bike riding? Or are they just staying in their room all the time? Are they just on screens and not having balance? You know, Dr. Kitty said, you know, the screen time, but it's the lack of the balance of the outdoor time. So when you look at signs, you're looking at, you know, changes in behavior, any negative self-talk and self-talk is, you know, what are you saying to yourself in your head and what are they articulating kind of negative self statements? What's the frequency of it, you know, and what's the intensity? So again, it's not just the behavior, it's how much, how intense, how often. And um, my big thing is, is it getting in the way? So some signs are even the sleep, it becomes very dysregulated. We need enough sleep to think clearly, um, but are they sleeping too much? Are they not sleeping enough? What are their eating patterns? In addition to looking for any signs of 
self-harm or they're wearing long sleeves and it's hot out you know that may be a sign of something going on cutting or um, other behaviors that are problematic so it's important as a parent to really have a watchful eye but also look at how intense is it and not wait to reach out to somebody for help until it's more extreme and you're at the suicidal ideation point. Thank you. Those are really, really helpful things to be looking for. Katie, as a mom, what do you what do you think are some signs that parents can be looking at to see how we're doing? You mean like personally as parents, like how uh, our self-care is? So as parents, what are what might be some signs that we're not handling everything very well and that we're struggling? You know, it's it's I'm you know I'm a, a frontliner and uh, I was in the ER last night and you know I was talking to my sister about this yesterday. I think extreme fatigue, just not finding because um, I actually am like I'm so tired lately and I feel like a lot of that has to do with your mental health. So a lot of your mental health is actually directly correlated with your physical health. Um, and this is really apparent for children as well. If you have a child that's like complaining of a chronic abdominal pain, a chronic headache, and you know you have now tested out all of the organic causes and done all the um, workup and the imaging and everything's kind of resulting as negative. You're not finding that organic cause. A lot of that is paired to mental their mental health as well. So you might see those change in their behavior as well, or they might start complaining about physical signs when in reality it it, it, it and they do go hand in hand. And the same is true for adults, right? So. We don't have the same passion that we did before. We're not doing the exercises. We're not, we're not doing the things that make us happy. The things that made us happy aren't making us happy now. Um, we're more tired, we're more fatigued, we're more irritable than we normally are. We are, we are trying to reach out to things that will de-stress us that maybe is not in a healthy pattern that we're not used to. And uh, even adult and children are all, we're all about behavioral patterns. And you know, once we develop that pattern, whether it's a good pattern or a bad pattern, it becomes something that um, we look towards for security. So whether it's having a glass of wine every single night or exercise in the positive direction, we do tend to, to use patterns in order to give us comfort and security. Um, so you know, I would say change in pattern, change in passion, change in what's making you happy are things to look out for and to um, you know, just acknowledge. Because I think as parents, we tend to push our own problems under the rug. We are the last, like we are more worried about our children. We are more worried about our husband, our partner, our work colleagues, whatever it is, sister, aunt, whatever role you play. And then it sneaks up on you. Like all of a sudden you might have like an emotional outburst over something that seems relatively small and something you could handle a month ago, all of a sudden it becomes a lot bigger than it normally is. And I think just paying attention to your body, and your emotions and you know the different patterns that you're picking up is really really important because you want to try to address them earlier on and this is true with children too like i dr mary was saying we don't want it to get to a point where our child is having suicidal ideation kind of start to see their patterns ahead of time and get them the help that they need so that it doesn't get to that point where it's like boiling over that is really helpful and also felt oddly personal because some of those things may have happened in my house. Um, Kier, I want to house. <laughs> it's, it's so hard to have that long-term perspective when you're all together all the time. Absolutely. Um, Kier, I feel like there's so much emphasis on how moms as parents are coping and there's a lot less um, there's a lot less discussion about how dads are doing. Um, and I follow your socials pretty religiously and you seem like such an engaged and present parent and like a real equal partner in terms of parenting your daughter. And especially with dads working from home, I'm wondering if you can shed some light for us on how these things are playing out for, for dads because that's not a conversation that we have as often. 
Yeah, absolutely. There's so many aspects to this thing. There's an economic aspect. Um, and with that comes flexibility. I was just reading a report where they said 82% of fathers reported that they could have used more emotional support during this time. And it's not just by chance that the emphasis is on moms because moms, the research has shown that moms and women have been most severely impacted by the pandemic. Um, a large percentage of women have left the workforce. Childcare becomes the sole burden of the woman in the house. Uh, it's just unfair to moms. Uh, what we also know is that the new mental health revolution is largely being driven by women, which is a beautiful thing. But what happens with that is that the language is usually uh, language that, is, that caters more to the way that women use community and women utilize their social resources. And a lot of times it doesn't really fit the things that men need in the same bubble. And there is a dire lack of resources out there for men. Um, with fathers in particular, uh, there's just some research that emerged that said that a majority of men receive their social interactions from work. And, they, and now that that is a little bit more frazzled, what happens is they become more dependent on their partner for social interactions and more dependent on their partners for uh, for help alleviating these issues that are just bouncing around in their heads all left and right. So the lack of access to community and friends and groups of men who are like minded, other dads, I sorely miss my friends who I would hang out with and just get a break from the house or get a break from the kids or get a break from the monotony that's just that used to be work in one place and home in another. And now it's just one gelatinous ball of uh, uh, inseparable thing that you can't tell which way is which sometimes. Uh, my biggest hope, I'll end with this, my biggest hope for the dads and the men out there, because I can't ever open my mouth on a large platform without really encouraging people to seek the help of a mental health professional, uh, because we also know that men identify strength a lot differently, and that correlates directly to the likelihood that you'll reach out for professional mental health services. So if you have a car that is a really high-end car and it's really sophisticated, if it breaks down, you're probably not going to grab a wrench by yourself. You're probably going to go and see a specialized mechanic. If you run into legal, legal trouble, you're probably not going to try to fight it out in court yourself. You're probably going to call a lawyer. And I just encourage the men and the dads who are listening to know that it is not a mark on your strength or, um, or, or on your capabilities for you to seek the help of a mental health professional and help you really start to unwind those tightly wrapped cords that are causing you difficulty in life. Thank you so much. I think that's such an important point. I, I know that it seems as if it's more socially normalized for women to seek that kind of care and support and treatment than it is for men. So I, I really think it's important that we all have those conversations and encourage our partners as women to, to go out and get that help and support. Um, let's talk about what parents and what families can do to model healthy coping as best we can under difficult circumstances um, to help us, you know, be responsible, be proactive. Um, I have a bunch of teenagers and they are all about self-care. And I always tell them like self-care is work, guys. You know, it's not face masks. You know, okay, it can be face masks. Face masks can be part of it, but it's also really doing the work and making yourself um, feel a little uncomfortable dealing with your stuff. And um, I'm just wondering what, what you guys feel are ways, and then narrating that for your kids. Like I had to do some real thinking about the fact that, you know, I made some bad choices. I had to delete apps off my phone because I've been, you know, really distracted by my phone lately, or I got really frustrated and I yelled at you guys and you don't deserve to be spoken to like that. And I, I, I really apologize and I hope that you'll forgive me. Um, Anyway, so let's talk about some ways that you guys uh, can suggest uh, parents modeling healthy behavior. Can we start with Katie? Sure. So um, a few things, you know, I think that it's really important that when speaking to our children, as I keep alluding to, because I, again, as an, an ER physician, I see it come to a head um, when at the end, when it gets more serious is 
opening those lines of communication early on and doing it in a way in a non-stressful environment, right? So like maybe you, you go for a walk with your child or maybe you talk to them at dinner time or before they go to sleep and establishing to them that you're always part of their support system and that you know whatever problem they have that it's that we will work it out as a family always being there and always letting them know and understand that you are on their team and you want the best for them and knowing when to take a step back too because when children are very emotional and they're in a heightened sense of stress it's not the time right to reprimand them or to try to communicate to them it's really in those quiet times that we have more of an impact. So opening up and creating those times to have that impact is really, really important. Also, like, for instance, doing healthy habits with your kids, going for a walk with your child. I went running with my two kids yesterday. Having those, showing them and modeling that behavior is really, really important, that healthy habits. And the last thing I would say is the way that we communicate, especially about drugs and alcohol in front of our children, right? So all of us, you know, can long for a glass of wine at the end of the day, but are we saying to our kids, oh, just give me a second, I just need a glass of wine. That's a different message and maybe your husband pouring you a glass of wine at dinner, you're enjoying it with your dinner. So those are two messages that we're sending to our kids. So even though maybe we do want that glass of wine to unwind, it's important that the messaging behind it is not that I am stressed out, now I need a glass of wine, but rather I'm gonna enjoy this glass of wine with a meal or you know, a, a message that's less, um, less aggressive and, le and, and better messaging for the child because we want them to see that our relationship with drugs and alcohol is a healthy one. And, and we, we, especially with all of us being in the same house at the same time, it's more important than ever that we, that we model that behavior for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kier, what are your thoughts about modeling healthy behavior and, and doing it in a way that we are showing our kids some proactive and healthy ways to, to take action? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier when you were speaking about transparency, how we have this expectation sometimes that because we know what best practice is in, a, in an anxiety, in a heightened anxious situation, that that's exactly how things will play out. And the reality that anybody listening is, that's it's just not going to be the case. I'll give you an example. Yesterday morning, I was just having a really bad day and my daughter would not get off of me for a bowl of cereal. She's four years old. That her job but that doesn't always make for the best situation when you have a person who's at a high heightened sense of stress and you have another person who's at a high heightened sense of need they usually clash together like uh, like ships in the night <laughs> that crash together uh, so i say all that to say uh the transparency of saying hey you know daddy yelled yesterday and that's not how we express the way we feel, is it? We come from, I myself come from a generation where I thought my mom was a superhero. I thought that she could handle everything, that she never really got upset, that she never really struggled, she never really cried. And it's really healthy for our children to see us as adults, as authoritative figures in their lives to express outwardly a healthy range of emotions. That includes the ones that we may not necessarily love. Uh, so just going back when you lose your temper or when you're not at your best moment, uh, going back back and explaining that, explaining the why and having a conversation about it. Now that's idealistic. You're not going to have a sit down conversation with your child for every, every time that you may lose your temper or lose your cool or just be not in the moment to really be fully there. Um, but separating yourself from the guilt and the shame of not being a perfect person in every situation really helps you to come to a moment where you can admit that this is what happened and it's not absolutely right, but I'm a human. And the next time that it happens, I'm going to try to handle the situation a lot better and even include them in the thinking process. What do you think about that? And that makes more that makes for more of a communal approach to mental health where your child just doesn't see the beginning and the end result. They actually get to see the middle process Processes and what goes on in between and how you're a complete person, which models what being a complete person looks like for them in the present and most certainly in the future. Yeah, I, I, I really love that. I also feel like there's a degree of mutual accountability, right, when we're having those conversations. And even for a kid as young as four, like your little nugget, like that 
that really gives her a sense of agency, right? If she's allowed to observe your behavior and provide some, you know, some feedback on that, like, okay, yeah, you did, but you apologized, so it's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And it teaches her how to handle that conflict. And it all it teaches her that conflict isn't always a bad thing, which is a wonderful tool to carry into mm-hmm. adulthood. It's a it's a it's a topic for conversation and it's a platform by which we spring a multitude of different conversations, but it's not always a bad thing. No, I, I I totally agree. I think it's it's much healthier than the sort of uh, tradition in a lot of families, which is just to stay silent and get angrier and angrier until it explodes. Absolutely, yeah, that hasn't worked for us traditionally over the last couple of hundred years, has it? No, <laughs> no. I don't think that's a great step. Um, Dr. Mary, what are your thoughts about this about modeling behavior? Well, I come about it from a couple of different angles, and I'm a very visual person, so I'll just show you a little bit what I do with families and with children. I use this rubber band to illustrate stress and resilience at the same time, and so take a rubber band, and when we are, you know, there's always a little bit of stress, right? There's always, and there's always some anxiety, and Anxiety actually a little bit can help us. It motivates us, it gets us to do things. It's a driver. The problem when it gets too much. And so I say, let's talk about all the things that are getting in the way that are creating some stress and the rubber band stretches and stretches, but we don't want it to snap. So what do we have to do? And some of the resilience building things are sort of, self-regulation, you know, mindfulness was mentioned. I do a cool little um, activity where we take a piece of Hershey, uh, Hershey Kiss because it's got a nice covering and we learn to look at it, feel it, smell it, and eventually taste it. And it's in the moment, it can help us calm down. So we talk you know, with families and with kids and teens and college students, you know, what other ways can we calm down? Uh, We can do breathing really from belly breathing instead of when we're panicked and from our chest. Um, We can visualize a nice, calm, relaxing place in our minds. And the beauty of that is you can go anywhere in your mind. Um, You can also connect with friends, have a support network, you know, look to your community, what is in your community. We are social creatures, but we can also lean on other people. We're not alone. And asking for help, that's a resilience skill, you know, as well as just, um, you know, being proactive, taking initiative so we don't feel like we're victims and problem solving. And slowly, the rubber band goes back to the normal state and it's flexible because we know that being able to tolerate uncertainty and think and problem solve different ways um, offer a lot of mental wellness. You know, the, the mental is connected to the health. So we want to model all kinds of behaviors of really how do we calm down? How do we de-stress? Transparency was mentioned. I model making mistakes a lot of times with the kids that I work with in therapy. I'm like, oh, I made another mistake. Let's see, what can I do? Well, I'm human. So it's not saying anything bad about myself that I made a mistake, but you know, pencils have erasers. Why? Because we all make mistakes and we have to keep a lot of erasers around because we're going to make a lot of mistakes. So I think all of those are modeling because there's no such thing as a perfect human, a perfect parent, a perfect anything. We want to strive for doing our best, um, but we can't be perfect. So I think all of those are forgiving ourselves. You know, as you said, if we lose our cool, I know for myself, sleep is really critical. If I don't get enough sleep, then I tend to be maybe a little bit more irritable or not think as clearly. And I think that's, you know, for everyone and movement and making sure if you're not a runner, walk or run around or go on a skateboard or bike or whatever. It's, it's really 
how do we cope is by taking action, um, being transparent, communicating and validating to our kids that their feelings are important, we're listening, and, and then help them with some perspective taking. So it's a lot, but I love to talk about resilience because we are resilient, all of us in different ways. We can just build it that much more to help us cope. I think all of those suggestions are really amazing. I know that in terms of emotional regulation and focus for myself, the best predictor of whether or not I can keep it together is the amount of sleep that I get. And it's because I am a mother, I assume that what is true for me is also true for my children. So if I'm cold, I make them put on a sweater. <laughs> but I also really push sleep because I know what it does for me. Um, and you had talked about building um, resilience and tolerance. And I think that um, that distress tolerance is something that, that I have seen in so many kids coming back to school um, is just having to flex those muscles and build that strength to be able to deal with other people and classes and demands. And um, it's really hard and takes time. You know, you don't get big biceps overnight. Got to work at it. And, and I think the message has to be that life has a lot of aspects that are uncomfortable and we have to get comfortable with discomfort so that we can push ourselves. Um, you know, if, if things are not going well or we have social anxiety, if we give into that and we don't face our fear and don't push ourselves past our comfort level, well, we're not going to really then improve. And that analogy of, you know, building our muscles is, is really a great one because that's what we're doing. We don't I'm not going to have muscles if I never lift a weight or if I don't do some kind of movement that's going to build. And the same is true for our mental health and our and our physical health. All of it comes together. It's, it's not really um, separate. They really are very much together because I have teens who come in with you know, complaining of severe headaches and, you know, what we then kind of peel the layers of the onion to find out what's going on that may be stressing them. And then we do another self-regulation, muscle relaxation is really great where you tense your muscles and then you slowly relax them. And little by little, you learn the difference between how the muscles feel when they're tense and when they're relaxed so that then you can catch yourself and actually do. It's called progressive muscle relaxation. If anybody wants to look it up, it's been around for many years and even seems to have positive effects on our immune system. So well, that's outstanding. Um, I'd like to take the next couple of minutes to field some questions from our, um, our audience. And the first question I particularly feel, um, how can you find this balance between wanting to check in with your kids and give them um, agency in these conversations and in the check-ins while also respecting their boundaries. And, you know, if they're telling you back off, how can you, you know, how can you respect that back off knowing that it could be pushing you away because there's a problem? It's so, I mean, I'm, I'm in teenager mindset. That's real common. When you want to have a mental health check-in, I, I often will hear, please stop you're being cringy. So I'm, I think this is a great, I think this is a great question. So um, Katie, do you think, do you want to start with this? Yeah, I think it's establishing that relationship in those cringe, non-worthy timeframes. Again, like it's like being, it, it's just allowing your child to understand that you're always there for them when they want to talk to you and establishing that at a time when it's a, not a stressful time. So, you know, it just, I'm always here. I'm always here to listen. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to feel forced to tell me right this moment, but when you calm down, you know, I'm always here. I'm always a listening ear. And then as Dr. Mary said is also, is that just a moment in time and space where they're having a really, a very stressful time and maybe they do need that space and they do need you to take a few steps back in order to kind of work it out themselves? Or is this becoming a pattern? Are you noticing things in their behavioral patterns that all, all of a sudden are becoming concerning? So is it that one time or is it a pattern? And if it does become a pattern, 
you know, giving those tips and those tricks ahead of time and, and working through it before it becomes a big problem in the end. Like I do feel, especially from a physician um, in the emergency room setting standpoint, that mental health, um, there's not a lot of resources that parents know about um, ahead of time, right? It's almost like when they get to that point, then they're looking for a psychiatrist or a psychologist and these, and, the, and our mental health community is so um, overflowing right now and has a lot of pressure on it that sometimes these children don't get an appointment for a month to two months out. So finding those resources, becoming your child's own advocate, finding those muscle relaxations, the tips and tricks in order to help them along the way when they're in a calm setting is, is really, really helpful. And again, it's between finding, is this an is this an a, a isolated event? Is this a stressful day? Or is there a pattern going on? And I think that that's really important to make that distinction. Um, I think that that's fantastic, right? The idea that you're looking both at what they're saying and what they're doing, because sometimes behavior is communication, right? Especially when our kids lack the, um, maybe the vocabulary to tell us how they're really feeling. Um, I want to ask here, you had talked about how overwhelmed, um, Katie had just talked about how overwhelmed so many mental health care providers are right now. If you suspect that your kid does need help, what are some steps you can take to find someone? And I specifically, how can we it's hard to find any provider, especially finding like a great one, right? At this point, so many families would be lucky just to get an appointment. But when you're talking about a kid who needs someone who can affirm them, maybe your kid is nearly atypical or um, a, you know LGBTQ plus or is dealing with you know racism at school and it's being minimized, like how can you help find them a provider who affirms their experiences and understands what they're going through and gives them the tools to deal with it? That's a really good question. Unfortunately, we're not in a space where you can do a lot of that work preliminarily. There, there are a lot of sites, typically your insurance provider, uh, prov let's just say you have insurance. If you have insurance, your insurance, pro insurance provider will have a list of mental health professionals, how long they've been in the field and sometimes what their specialties are. Uh, you can also find websites like doc reviews and things like that where people who have been to these clinicians and therapists can speak to what they actually do but a lot of that work has to be done after you actually find a therapist one good thing you can do is an informational interview with uh, a provider where you get to know what their therapeutic approach is what groups they typically work with some therapists maybe have more of a specialization and with marginalized groups of children like the lgbtqia population or maybe some have a specialty where children who are in the Latinx community and face those very specific issues can find the help that they need. But a lot of the groundwork is gonna to have to be done once you find a provider uh, and actually getting to talk to them and finding out what their specifications are and what they do. Also, there's a number of community resources that are, that are still available um, and school resources that are still available. Sometimes we underuse our children's guidance counselors and the counselors that inside the school building they usually know our children very well they have a very close connection to the age group they're not often clinically trained but there there is some uh, social troubleshooting, if you will, that they can do with the students that will really help mitigate some of the issues that they're facing and ultimately parent involvement helps sometimes you could be mom you're doing a lot. I need you to give me 10 feet. But if your child is seeing a provider and it's someone who's who's providing any type of service in that domain, especially someone in the school building, it's a good idea to be in the room with them and for help facilitate that conversation, letting them lead it, of course, but just being able to add contextual information that might help guide the process a little bit better. That's really good. That, that's really good feedback because that's, I don't know that that's something, number one, that most parents would think about and, num you know, going to the guidance counselor and number two, asking to be part of that conversation might not be something that the parents would think about. That's awesome. We are right. We have one minute left. Does anyone want to throw out? Um, oh, you know what? We should probably talk about what we're doing next week. Yeah. Um, next week, 
we are doing another amazing panel. This time we're talking about preventing underage drinking and other risk behaviors. The panel is phenomenal. Tiffany Jones, who's a licensed professional counselor and certified substance abuse counselor. Christine Coe, who is a neuroscientist, a parenting expert, and the co-author of Minimalist Parenting. And Jessica Leahy, who is the New York Times bestselling author of The Gift of Failure and The Addiction Inoculation. She's also um, a school teacher and a prevention coach. It's going to be outstanding, so I hope you'll join us. Um, thank you so much um, to, to Mary Alverd, Dr. Mary Alverd, Dr. Katie Friedman, and to Kara Gaines. This has been phenomenal. I feel like I've learned so much, and thank you all for joining us today, and thank you to Responsibility.org for hosting us. Thank you. This has been awesome. Yes, thank you to everybody. So much. I learned so much today from the- I do too. I did too. Yeah.